We're going to start our second panel now. Uh, we are going to do this the same way as the earlier panel, have a uh, discussion. Uh, I, I don't think I, I need to um, uh, spend time reciting the CV of each of our uh, panelists. The names are in front. Uh, let me just say that uh, all of our panelists uh, have had experience in uh, recent years as legal advisors to um, uh, government govern federal agencies with uh, security responsibilities. And I guess Stuart Baker has had the longest uh, experience uh, having been uh, general counsel to the NSA in the 90s. I, 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 Eric just leaned in and said, I think he's saying you're the oldest guy here. Oh, no, no. The most, <laughs> I meant to say the most experienced, which is why, which is why I'm going to start with you. Uh, so um, we have as a title, Are We at Cyber War? And if so, how should we fight it? Um, that title was left to us by uh, Vince Witkowski, who's the chairman of the uh, practice group on national security law for the Federalist Society. And having uh, chosen that title, he went off to um, fight a trade war or avert a trade war uh, in Geneva or someplace. Um, I, I think we, we should start with um, just that question of whether war is a uh, term that's just too uh, sensational or whether that's a helpful way of um, framing this. Uh, if we have a cyber attack that just does a lot of property damage but doesn't do physical injury, should we be thinking of that as war? And should we be thinking of uh, an, an, an extreme attack which does a vast amount of damage as something that's in a, a different category from the kinds of attacks that we're experiencing now, or let's say uh, terror attacks that are, are really upsetting pe to people because they put off the lights for two days, but um, perhaps don't do extensive damage. Let me start with Stuart, because you've started this field. That's scary. I, so we aren't at cyber war. I think that's pretty clear. That we're not actually in a cyber war. The kinds of damage that's being done doesn't really correspond to what you'd expect in a, a cyber war. Uh, but we can clearly see it from here, it seems to me, that uh, 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 the, there's a very real prospect that uh, in some future conflict, uh, uh, people will die in the United States because uh, of software-generated attacks. Uh, 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 attacks on SCADA systems can destroy or the, the fundamentals of civilian life. Uh, um, whether they'll be as effective as they could potentially be, we don't know. But uh, it, it really raises the prospect that uh, uh, we could suffer uh, extreme harm and real state-to-state uh, -state coercion by the use of these tools. Uh, um, and, and so thinking about cyber war is something we should be doing. Uh, what we're in now is, in many cases, cyber compulsion, uh, efforts to compel at least individual American actors to bend to uh, the will of a foreign state. Uh, uh, and uh, we have, frankly, no cyber strategy for fighting the war that we can see from here, uh, and no real cyber strategy for responding to the acts of sovereign compulsion that are already being felt uh, inside the United States. That's hard now. So I, I think we could just move down the table, but, but let me ask Eric just a clarifying question. Um, when you think about, because Eric has had a career in, in uh, the Army, uh, when you think about that term cyber war, do, do you think of this as there's a good possibility that we will have uh, a really damaging encounter which remains in the cyber realm? Or should we be assuming that, oh, no, that'll be part of, first they sink the Pacific fleet, and then they take out the missile bases, and then they do some cyber damage on the side. Should we, should we worry about something that is exclusively cyber? So first of all, I agree with Stuart that cyber war is not even close to where we're at now. Um, and to your question, I, I, because of the nature of cyber activities and cyber attacks, I doubt we will have a sterile cyber exchange that we will classify as war. Because what cyber really gives you 
is it gives you the, the components to affect things over a broad scheme. And so cyber attacks, as we call them, and, and we may get to the point of whether we're going to talk about what an attack is in cyber. But cyber attacks really uh, are a multiplier. They're much more effective in conjunction with other things. And we have seen, we have seen some of that take place uh, historically and in the recent past. But I think it's interesting talking about cyber war. You know, the, the new DOD cyber strategy that just came out, nowhere in here is the word war used. And in fact, nowhere in here is the even more politically correct term armed conflict. They talk about cyber attacks of, of, of significant consequence. That's the term they use. That's the buzzword in this new DOD cyber strategy. So they clearly, DOD at least, has clearly they've thought this through. They've made a decision to not talk in terms of war or even armed conflict or even conflict. They're talking about cyber attacks of significant consequence. We don't call it armed conflict. Do we have the expression wired conflict? <laughs> I have read that. I've not seen that in the law yet. So, so Catherine, you want to... So I think we won't, there won't be much disagreement in terms, I think, on this panel as to whether we're in some kind of, at the threshold of a virtual type of war. But as Eric said, what we've already seen is that certainly in kinetic conflicts, both sides are using cyber capabilities. So it is no secret anymore, um, because many of the nation states have now publicly declared that they are building up or have built up military capacity um, and cyber weapons. So we have about 30 nations that we know of that have built up the ability to develop cyber weapons that could do some significant damage and destruction um, now the question is, when are they going to limit the use of those weapons? I mean, what kind of conflict, what kind of context they're going to do that? I have to speak into this box. Um, I like speaking to you, so hopefully you guys can hear me and not just the box. Um, so when and how they're going to do that is what the game is about right now and what states are trying to do in terms of negotiating the rules of the road, if you will, rules of engagement. But many states are starting to develop their strategies and whether they you know, Secretary Carter, um, you know, announced the strategy last week in California, and, and it was interesting. Stuart and I, at the same time, were at um, the RSA conference in California. It was an interesting time for D to D DOD to announce they got a new office out there, close and embedded with Silicon Valley, just like DHS does. But here you are at this conference of 36,000 at RSA, a very technical and um, historically um, vendor-specific conference but now a lot of government people and policy and legal minds in there. And when Carter announced the strategy, and it was interesting, we timed it such that it was held off in the minute till the kind of a good moment in that conference, um, during that conference, uh, the reaction of the private sector, and I listened and talked to CEOs of some of our major cybersecurity firms in the United States predominantly, but others. Um, one, they weren't very impressed by it. So, I think part of the, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about is the development of not just milit DOD strategy in and of itself and what that means for other nations, bilaterally talking to each other, multilaterally, but also the relationship between the government and DOD specific, whether it's NSA and Cyber Command, with the private sector. That is a place where we know that in conflict, when we do get to the stage, which many anticipate in the threat reporting coming from the DNI, clearly states the threat that they believe is, you know, if not imminent, soon to be, that relationship that DOD will have to have with the private sector to basically have their capabilities functional and protect our homeland, which is owned by the private sector and not the military and not the government, that's going to be key in any future conflict. And, and unfortunately, we're only at the beginning of starting to figure out how that relationship is going to work. Um, but no virtual war. I think we're going to stay true to what we've already seen, but it's going to escalate. Um, I think we're going to see physical, kinetic conflict with greater capabilities in, their, in the cyber realm, whether it's taking down defensive air systems or it's actually um, causing systems to break and not work. So everybody so far seems to be in general agreement. That's why I'm looking forward to John McKee's contribution. <laughs> Let me just set you up and say, um, <laughs> I'll pull rank. I, I believe I was uh, watching movies uh, before you were born, and in those days we used to have movies about the Cold War, and it didn't actually matter, you know, 
whether there was an actual conflict with troops on the ground, the premise of a half a dozen Alfred Hitchcock movies was that, of course, we're engaged in an ongoing conflict of some sort with the Soviet Union. Maybe war in that somewhat kind of background, soft focus sense it is relevant to the situation we're in now. Well, thanks, uh, Dean. And, uh, so Dean, where's Dean? <laughs> thank, yeah, well, I actually wanted to thank uh, Dean and the Federal Society for putting this together and inviting me and Steptone Johnson for the very cool microphone. This is like the biggest mic I've ever had to speak into. But it's sort of like uh, Star Trek IV where uh, Scotty gets a mouse for the first time because computer, computer. <laughs> and, it's very funny. and you can take it over. Oh. <laughs> I've got to give it back to the Chinese intelligence because they're the ones who really uh, happy this. And uh, I want to thank Jeremy also for moderating the panel because our moms clearly have the same taste in clothing. It's perfectly matched. <laughs> um, and for scheduling this panel at 7.30 California time. So uh, I, Jeremy's quite right. I guess I would disagree a little bit in that I think uh, that the distinction between war, war and not war is no longer helpful. And uh, the reason this, uh, that I would say this is because of changes in technology that were presaged long before now. But uh, I think you can see the 9-11 attacks as an example of this, the rise of terrorist groups, and I think cyber warfare, this clean distinction between a uh, war between nation states and then I don't know, peace law enforcement operations, I think, is, is, is eroding. It's eroding quickly. Cyber just is, a, is a, just the most prominent example of that. So one way to think of this, I think, is goes to Jeremy's question about you know, the Cold War and the contest between the US and the Soviet Union is to ask whether, if you're not going to have this distinction, what is really at work? And what I would say is that what you have is a spectrum of things that countries do to each other to try to coerce each other. Countries are hopefully irrational. They should try to settle their disputes. One way they settle their disputes is by signaling to each other through the use of coercive methods about, uh, about how serious they are, about what they're willing to go to to win. And hopefully after you go through this period of escalations between each other, the countries rationally should settle because ultimately you want to have a settlement rather than uh, go to a full-blown uh, armed conflict. And so you think about uh, cyber, what the United States seems to have done, it seems to me, is that we've tied our own hands in this, uh, this game, if you will, between the United States and our rivals, where our rivals are regularly attacking us in many ways using uh, cyber and the United States because we have this uh, very strong belief that there should be this clear break between not war and war. We effectively uh, limit ourselves by refusing to go over some step that would break a barrier, which it doesn't seem to me other countries, our rivals, believe in or operating along. And in fact, I would say, it just ended, that this kind of clear break, while it might have made sense, I think, for a world of conventional weapons and great powers going to war, is actually counterproductive and may even be harmful in this new world. You have this, not the next, just not us individually as a country, we are refusing to take measures and respond or to prevent or preempt these kinds of attacks on the United States. But I think it's actually worse for the world because uh, one thing about cyber, at least, is that it gives you the ability to use coercive methods against each other that doesn't kill, that don't kill people, that don't have a kinetic effect, that don't destroy, uh, uh, in the conventional sense, resources or buildings or ultimately uh, human beings. And so, actually, it opens up the possibility of a return to the world of the kind we had before World War One, where countries regularly used to take what was then called economic warfare or Pacific War, all kinds of economic tactics, non-Cold War war tactics against each other um, to try to coerce each other. And ultimately, those are we should welcome them, even though they look scary or might be individually harmful, because they actually have the effect of reducing uh, the rush to a more full-blown conflict. The more uh, information nations are providing to each other, through the use of smaller scale uh, coercion, the more likely you are to head off some kind of bigger war. Where, so countries aren't left, like the United States, not left to, uh, to a choice between, well, we could send the FBI after them, or we have to go over the barrier of war and use, uh, go into a world where uh, conventional and cyber war, uh, a very destructive nature, 
is all acceptable. Rather, you want to see more graduated steps where countries can do smaller things to each other. And I think so. I think actually this war versus non war line is actually uh, unhelpful and actually ultimately counterproductive. Well, that actually brings me to the next thing I wanted to ask about, and I'll start with Eric, because you have the most experience uh, advising the military about the loss of armed conflict. Do you think it is reasonable, uh, as um, I guess the NSA has recently said, that they think cyber retaliation should be bound by the law of armed conflict? Do I think it's reasonable? Absolutely, if the law of armed conflict is triggered. And those of us who follow this has been a big discussion with the United Nations with the government experts as to whether the law of armed conflict applies and what, what circumstances it applies. And I think we're getting to some consensus as a global matter that if the, the traditional triggers of armed conflict are crossed, then it would apply to cyber activities within that armed conflict. I think we're getting to global consensus there. But, but in a sense, this goes to John's point. Right? I mean, there's, there was a great article written by uh, Rosa Brooks talking about this exact thing that John is talking about, whether, we should, whether this definition between war and not war is really helpful. And, and in the future, I, I take John's point to be you know, helpful. But right now, for our legal paradigms, that's the paradigm we have. Certainly, as a matter of domestic law, whether we're at war or not, makes a big difference. Right? I mean, there, there are a large number of statutes that trigger if we're at war. Internationally, there are there are authorities that are only triggered once you are at war or on conflict. So in that sense, it's still useful. If I could just press you for, for one more quick round on this. Uh, apart from whether we cross the threshold that, that allows us to say it's on conflict, there are all kinds of rules about what you're allowed to do in the course of on conflict. It used to be thought that reprisal was a necessary part of the law of armed conflict. If they broke the rules, you have to have the authority to hit back in the same way. Uh, a lot of people say now, oh, no, 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 that, that isn't the rule anymore. You, you can't hurt civilian objects just because the other side has done that. Uh, you might think cyber is a particularly tempting, um, what's called technique, tactic, because you, you can do a lot of damage without necessarily hurting people directly. So maybe we should be more open to reprisal, at least, in that realm? Well, I mean, obviously, there's, there's a large block of, of world states that don't believe reprisal is lawful, not at all. The U.S. happens to be yes. an outlier. We think it is. But most of those are engaged in fighting. Other than the Europeans, that's, that's, very, that's a very good point. But I think we, we are, in one sense, stepping over this idea of countermeasures. We, we have had, as a doctor of international law, this idea of countermeasures, well-grounded in international law. And it is, it is designed to, to meet that requirement that John is saying we can't meet. And I think if we can, if we can, if U.S. can be more effective in our uh, application of countermeasures, which are, which are unlawful means in response to a, a, an unlawful act, but are below that line of use of force, those are the things that we should be focusing ourselves on. And, and I think actually those are the things that in many cases we are focusing ourselves on. And certainly what this strategy is trying to get us to is to, to a more robust use of countermeasures particularly with respect to cyber, that open up a broad range of options for us that we maybe aren't taking as effective use of as we should be. Do you want to add something before I... So, focusing on the laws of war and, and the topic regularly comes up and we've all spoken at many conferences where it's about war. It, it's useful because when you, you need to think ahead in terms of when we get to that stage, what are, what's going to be the rule, the playbook for each side? However, what we tend to overlook then, um, in the, and what we should be doing more of also currently, is looking at all of the other laws, other bodies of law that are relevant in the cyber domain. So, which, if they are violated, there are things you can do, and this will come up in the context of common measures. So, telecommunications law, right? Um, privacy laws, um, to, both domestic and at the international level. Um, there are things that say, well, what Stuart and I just were talking about, IP theft. And so you're talking about a different body of law. We're talking about TRIPS and the WTO and that kind of framework. Um, there are currently in the United States, and I'll, I'll kind of back Eric up on this, the United States is looking at those other bodies of law and finding, for instance, the most recent, the China case. And the theft of IP is universally accepted as not acceptable, including 
by trying that legend, by signing up for the WTO and TRIPS. So I think you leverage, you don't just think of LOAC, although that's important, but you think of all the other tools that one can use, including, including the law enforcement tools, right? And, and it may not be as effective as you want it the first time, but there is a lot of value with working up to a case and using those other tools. What I think is dangerous is if you conflate, um, for instance, law enforcement and national security and war. And I think we've already been through um, a time in this country, in the world, not far off in our memory, where you see the danger of doing that. And I think many smart people are in the government with memories that haven't faded, and they are carefully thinking about this and therefore drafting rules of engagement in cyber with that in mind, whether it's the PDD-20, the strategy that came out which incorporated these concepts, and I think that's critical. And I think if you say everything is conflated, and there's a line that there is no line, and then you'll get a body of people saying then maybe those laws that were dedicated to war are not relevant. The question then is, what is the war? So let me, that is very dangerous. Let, 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 me, let me try disagreeing forcefully with the notion that the law of armed conduct is a useful tool in this area. The only thing that makes me think maybe it is that the Chinese haters are not shut. Uh, but first, um, it has frozen our military at the stick for years now. Uh, as they say, I don't know, the lawyers have to tell me what I can do. I, 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 and, you know, and I, I've started giving speeches on uh, cyber war strategy saying, well, I got a JD, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, I, the, but in fact, uh, there's a psychology uh, study that I uh, uh, learned when I was an undergrad where you put two bantam roosters in a cage too small for them, they will fight. But if it's not quite too small, they will furiously peck and scratch at the dirt, uh, which is called displacement behavior. And that's exactly what all this talk about the law of armed conflict is. It gives people a sense that they're having a meeting about something relevant when they should be asking, how do we stop people from doing things we don't want done to us? And how does our cyber capability uh, interact with that? Uh, that is to say, actual strategy. Yeah. Uh, it is asymmetric. Uh, we're going to agonize over this, and nobody that we are realistically going to fight with uh, uh, is going to agonize over it for two seconds. In fact, I think you could make the argument uh, uh, that whenever we announce a norm about what we think is inappropriate as a matter of the law of armed conflict, oh, attacking financial systems, that would be terrible. That's got to be a violation. You know, the, the uh, North Koreans and the Iranians immediately say, OK, let's take that off. That scares them. Let's do that. And they've already done that. Uh, so we are not actually creating norms that anyone that we care about will observe. Uh, uh, and so what that lets us say, oh, we're fighting another enemy as if we haven't already spent a lot of time fighting enemies that don't deserve the law of armed conflict. So I, you know, saying they're bad because of that doesn't really change anything, it seems to me. Uh, it's not useful as, a, as an adjunct to policy, because I, I, I will, if there's anybody here who can give me an example of something that we wouldn't do because of the law of armed conflict, that we also wouldn't do for policy reasons, I'll buy you lunch. Uh, uh, I, I don't think there is, in fact, anything that we would, uh, that law of armed conflict tells us, especially in this area, other than that we don't know, uh, that would uh, actually supplement the decision making by policymakers. And finally, it empowers the wrong people to tell us what to do. We do not need law professors telling us how to fight a cyber war. And most of international law and the law of armed conflict is about telling either JAGs or law professors, you have the power to tell us how to fight a war, and I don't think either of them are that good at it. I want to ask uh, Professor Jensen, formerly JAG, yeah. <laughs> how great you are, as well. Yeah, uh, so, so I do and, have, and you might learn a lot. I, uh, I do have a countering view. Um, I, my experience has been that it's not the law that is the constraint on military actions, it's the policy. Um, the law, in fact, provides us many more options than the policy may allow. So, 
So your characterization of JAGs, of, of military being unwilling to take action without a JAG looking over the shoulder, was certainly not my experience in Iraq. Um, my experience was that, that in most of the constraints, in fact, well, I don't want to say all, most, the vast majority of constraints came as a matter of policy rather than a matter of law. And then in fact, the law of armed conflict, I mean, if, if you don't want to, if you want to throw the law of armed conflict out, then you're back to a cat that says, well, what, where is the rule book? Um, and, and I, and I, I disagree again with the premise that because our opponents don't abide by the rules, that means we should not. Um, that has never been the right way to approach it as a matter of policy, law, morals, ethics, however you want to say it. We abide by the rule book because of the humanizing effect it has on us, not because it makes us effective. Um, when we send soldiers out into combat, we have to provide them a, a toolkit by which they can kill someone and come back to society and, and be able to reintegrate themselves, feeling like they've done a good thing, not a bad thing. And that's what the law of armed conflict does, it humanizes that. And that will be true in cyber conflict as well. So I would strongly oppose the idea that the law of armed conflict does not provide us any benefit. In fact, I think it is key. And if we can mesh more clearly the policy constraints with the law of armed conflict, then I think we may get to where we can actually effectively do what we need to do in response to the people that you're worried about. I, I want to add just one thought to what you said and let John you respond to it. Uh, just from reading about the history of this, I was struck uh, how important uh, the law of armed conflict, or the law of war as they called it then, was at the beginning of the First World War, when people on the Allied side really worked themselves into great indignation that Germany was doing all these things that were lawless. It made them feel much, much more important to hit back really hard because there were rules and they had just abandoned the rules. And it seems to me what you're advocating is, well, everyone hits everyone and it's just a question of uh, how hard you hit to send the signal. And maybe that ends up actually being a little bit demoralizing to us in the sense that we feel like, uh, okay, let's opt out of the next few rounds because we didn't really like the boxing that much and it didn't have importance. Maybe we need to have rules just to give ourselves some moral confidence. Yeah, I, look, in, in general, I'm a very big fan of this uh, essay that uh, Frank Easterbrook wrote called The Law of the Horse. And it's a great article, a little essay. Uh, everyone should read it. It's about 10 pages long, so it's you know within all of our reading capacities uh, for an airplane trip. And his argument was, I, I think it's very good. He said that every time something new happens, there's a group of people who say, let's throw out the law and come up with completely new rules. And he said, and then there are people who say, let's just adapt the old rules to the new thing. That's what the common law is. So he said, there used to be a thing called law of horses. Now there isn't anymore. But when cars came along, we adapted the rules of horse accidents, I guess, to car accidents. And so there's this evolutionary process. And so I think that's one side of what you hear here is that the laws of armed conflict can safely adapt to this new thing, cyber war. Um, but on the other hand, every now and then, there are these big changes in technology or society that do say we should come up with a new set of rules. And uh, Jeremy, I think your question uh, points to that last break, which was World War One. I mean, the big change you had last in the last, uh, of, I think, of this kind, and we could argue whether it really was a change or not. And this, we could, people, I think, are arguing that cyber war really isn't that big a change, so we don't have to come up with new rules. But as it was the Industrial Revolution, which led to the kinds of things you saw in the beginning of World War One, which this debate unfortunately reminds me of, like submarine warfare, uh, aerial combat, bombing, long-range artillery, machine gun. And there were people at the beginning of World War One who thought that the, the rules of war that were developed during the Napoleonic era should be used and continue to be used through World War One, and it was a failure. Right? In the end, uh, the normal rules of war did not figure out a way to handle submarine warfare. Uh, you could say, I guess, we entered World War, I, World War I as a country because we didn't like unrestricted submarine warfare, although we were very happy to employ it in World War II. Uh, World War II ends with uh, the large-scale civilian bomb, uh, large-scale bombing civilian targets, although claimed to be for military purposes. But I think that, that that effort, that claim that you could use existing laws of war to adapt easily to the new kinds of warfare permitted by the Industrial Revolution turned out to be uh, false, turned out to be wrong. That was a point where you need to rethink the rules. I think cyber warfare uh, is opening up that, uh, that problem again. I, I don't think that it's so similar 
to existing methods of warfare that you can just kind of do. And so uh, I think one example of this is this claim that there is this kind of global consensus about the rules of war and that we should then take the playbook and use it and send our, uh, I don't know what you would call them, our soldiers, cyber warriors to fight with them. Uh, this doesn't, I mean, maybe China and Russia say that they uh, also agree that the laws of war should apply, but it doesn't seem to be true by their actual conduct. Or even look at our regional rivals like Iran and North Korea. Are they, do they seem to be bound by the laws of armed conflict too in, the, in their operations? I, don't, I mean, there may be, again, there may be lots of countries that say we ought to obey them, uh, but a lot of them I don't think are actually uh, fighting in this war. And they're actually kind of free riding on the United States to provide their security. And yet they're trying to constrain us in the kind of methods that are used to supply their security. So I think, I think the hard question is the one that came at the end of both the last two comments, which is, well, if the existing laws of war don't work, then what do you replace them with? So Jeremy's point, I think, is that you could return back to the pre-World War I world where there were all kinds of rules worked out for different kinds of fighting. Like, and he's written about this in several articles about uh, you know, economic warfare. You think about Teddy Roosevelt shelling uh, you know, you know, minor Latin American countries to get them to pay their custom duties and so on. So you, have, you used to have a much broader spectrum of the kinds of uses of force that were not considered full-blown war. Obviously, uh, there is no alternate playbook right off the, the bookshelf for uh, cyber warfare, but you could go back to historical examples, or you could try to figure out new ones right now. That should be the task, I think, of law professors and all the people on Stewart's, uh, uh, I was going to call it something list, <laughs> you know, his bad list. Those are the people who should be thinking about what should those new rules look like rather than, I think, claiming that there's just an easy to look open book of rules that we just easily apply. So I just don't think that the reality bears that out. Can I start you on a new question? You can fold in. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, if we are thinking about going back to old rules, or anyway, old approaches, one of the things we used to do was uh, invite uh, private actors to participate. Um, had uh, mercenaries who were an important part of European war uh, before the um, 19th century. And we had uh, privateers in naval war. Uh, a number of people have said it, it would be sensible to enlist the efforts of uh, private business firms, uh, maybe computer specialists to organize themselves, at least to trace attacks and maybe to do some kind of retaliation. Is that a thing that we should be open to, or, or should we regard that as so contrary to the modern approach to law and security that it should just be off the table? So the short answer is yes, certainly. And yes, think that. No, and um, do it. And in fact, there's so when we say about the number of different ways of um, engaging with and um, having the private sector work with the government on the threats and the cyber pain. And the stage is already, it is already started. So when you say, I wouldn't use the words mercenaries, right? But you can bring the private security firms in and the government particularly. So I know there are two parts of the government, um, well, more than two, but I can talk about uh, two that have actually engaged with these companies actually for their capabilities on the forensic side, right, for the attribution element. That this is not um, the days of when the government was the sole um, holder of all the information that we could then negotiate at an international level or start a war about or find out who attacked us, but the private sector actually has um, most of the capabilities. And NSA um, has quite a bit, but we're talking other parts of the government, FBI, they work, I know, the top security firms that work with the FBI um, and on the Sony case and others, um, but also the USTR. Um, I've been talking to the people at the, the trade people, and they are relying on, um, and, and their battle is trying to get some of the private companies to give them the data they need so they can go to the WTO and bring a case against China. Right? And the challenge, of course, is keeping the name of the company um, out from the public and being able to use the data to make a case, right? And the more companies, the better. So am I, am I in support of saying to U.S. private companies, whenever you suffer cyber intrusion and you've determined on your own that you've suffered damage, 
in any respect. And you are free to do whatever you can, technically, to fight back, or hire someone to do whatever they can. I would not, I would not go that far. Clearly, um, in, we've had a lot of discussion in the last couple of years. Would you authorize companies to, to do tracing? So I, I would argue there are things that are legal now um, that don't trip up against the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Right? You can, um, if something is stolen of you, you can trace. Now, the challenge is, is whether DOJ ultimately is bringing any case against a company that had unauthorized access into somebody else's system, whether in doing more than just tracing. In, in tagging or potentially, you know, doing damage on that side. But there are other means you, you could give, and a lot of companies are doing this now, it's basically counterintelligence 101. You put fake information out, or you, you know, um, or they create uh, a honeypot, right? Attract the bad guys to the false information. Right? Of course, you can do basic network um, defense, right? You can actually make your system um, better protected, and that's a lot of what many of the people focus on. Um, but there is some some area. The court cases, though, don't give us clarity. So at your general counsel in a firm that's either thinking about doing it yourself or hiring a security firm, then you want to be careful about how far you go. The DOJ and Congress have been looking at both that statute and other means of actually assisting private companies. Uh, let me just ask Eric. Do, do you have any qualms about the listing private efforts to enhance the security of our computer network. So, so I, I do, depending on how you enlist them. One of the most typical things about cyber, certainly in the legal paradigm right now, is that um, cyber gives state level violence to individuals. When you see someone show up with a tank, you assume it's a state that's coming at you, not an individual. But someone can show up with a cyber tool that has the same amount of a power, the same effect. Uh, whether they got off the black market, whether they paid somebody to do it, however they've gotten that. And so now you've, you've invested through cyber means um, individuals with state level violence. And that, that's a very difficult thing. We have tools to respond to states or nations when they do things. We don't have as many tools to respond to individuals. We have to go through kind of a, a reactive mode where we seek law enforcement and expedition, and it's just not near as effective. So if we start to enlist or to allow uh, privateers, granting letters from Mark and replies to all these things that you've read about uh, to people in the United States. I, I, agree with you. I know. Uh, who are not uh, who are not government <coughs> entities. And I think you just make that quagmire more difficult and more mixed. Um, and, and until you solve the problem of responses to that, I think it becomes difficult. Now, if they're doing things that Catherine's talked about, where they're helping with forensic development, where they are helping with attribution in a in a non uh, active defense mode, I, I'm certainly okay with all that, but I think once you start having, once you start as a government authorizing individuals to take this or allowing individuals to take these actions, you only make it, you only make the legal paradigm more difficult to get to unless you adopt the idea that states are responsible for any cyber actions that come from within their borders, which, which current state practice will not support, but that I think that's where we're actually at. Can I interject on, so I'd like to get Eric's view on, and what about bringing them, bringing the private sector in who may have been the, the victims, and, and in a sense deputizing them? Different than the letters and mark kind of president, but basically saying it, it's similar to having a contract with them, right? Which the government's done in many ways over the years, including in war. But bringing them in and say, you now are under our government rules. So you've got the authority, the, you know, the oversight, and the government will be responsible, ultimately, for anything that private entity does. But what about that kind of bring in, 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 and I'm talking about an active defense. So I, I can live with that, but the problem is with the cyber response, those responses aren't marked, right? When, when you're the victim of, of Google's response to what you've done, all they see is that it's coming from Google. They don't know that it's coming from a deputized Google or from a state attributable Google. All they know is it's coming from Google, right? And I think that makes a difference. It, if we, can, if we can somehow, when we deputize that private response, if we let the world know we're deputizing that private response, or at least the target know we're deputizing that private response, then I think you're okay on the legal paradigm. It's more difficult, you know. Did you require notice? 
Well, I mean, I think that goes beyond what the law was that, currently. That's what the letter of Mark was. Yeah, it I was, was a notice. Notice, right? And, and why did they have to know it through Google? Any technically smart person would say, you would not have it look like you're coming from the victim itself. So who are you going to have it come look like it's coming from? Somebody else. The government does it. So why can't they bring in a private company? <laughs> you can make it look like North Korea every time I'm 40. I I have, and I, you know, I think Eric's, Eric went in the discussion where people often go in Washington, which is, oh my God, this will be a free for all war, war of all against all, they will be shooting back. Whereas yeah. currently, right, 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 now we're just, it's all in time. I, 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 and and, um, and I, I have to say, I am reminded of the uh, NRA slogan, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. Uh, <laughs> that is a problem here, right? Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the forensic teams and the victim are in a position to understand what's happening uh, in a way that law enforcement simply won't be able to comment and respond to quickly enough. So you've got a time advantage for the victim in responding to these. You've got an information advantage. Uh, uh, you've got a pretty good idea of what they're stealing, why they're stealing it, and how to respond to it. The example I often use in this context is very practical. When, when uh, people steal information from you, they, they automate the theft. Uh, and uh, uh, they release uh, software onto your system. It collects information. It stores it up. Uh, encrypts it, uh, compresses it, and then logs on to a command and control server and deposits your stolen information on that uh, uh, command and control server. Uh, and there it sits. It, remarkably, uh, the guys who are stealing this from us, this stuff from us, care so little about it that they're just drinking coffee or sleeping or having dinner while this stuff is being stolen. And once a day, once a week, they check their traps to see if there's any new mail from you, uh, and they download it. So it sits there for hours or days, uh, waiting for the milkman to come by on his rounds. Uh, which means two things. You see it go, if you're the victim. You look at the software that just logged onto that uh, program because it's on your system. It has the actual login and um, uh, password to get onto that system so that it can deposit your secret on that uh, uh, server. So you know everything you need to know to get your stuff back, and if you act right now, you might get there before the milkman does. That's a violation of the Computer Fraud Abuse Act. You have walked onto somebody else's machine without their authority. Uh, it is insane to say that. Uh, literally insane, because uh, you're not going to be able to get the cops to, to to come in and get a court order to authorize you to do that. Uh, and that's the kind of action that we should be permitting that would allow us to recapture this stuff, uh, that would allow us to gather information from that command and control server about the uh, uh, attacker. Uh, and um, there's no war of all against all with doing that. It seems to me it's a very practical concern that we're already fighting against uh, governments that have enlisted their private sector, all their cyber thieves are busily stealing stuff for themselves and their governments, uh, uh, that we should have the forensics guys who are often better than the government responders uh, enabled to do a lot of this stuff, not shoot back, but uh, investigate that. It would be fair to say your model is not a mercenary army, but the neighborhood watch. It may be uh, dog bounty hunters. <laughs> There's one other concrete thing that is being discussed. I'm not, I don't believe Congress is in any mood to um, allow this at this point, but many of, or at least two of the um, very well known companies in this space. Um, have asked for this, uh, and that is, there's a look at the Microsoft cases, and they've said, listen, we do not have that kind of time, it takes months, to get those kind of warrants, 
um, and we don't have the money. We don't have a school of lawyers. Um, but what could help us, meaning the companies that would actually be doing so-called ACA, is if we can get civil subpoenas. And so I've been, there's been discussions with DOJ and FBI, um, but it doesn't seem at this stage, maybe, hopefully, uh, Congress will change its mind. It's worse than that. It's actually people that you would think of as generally conservative and favoring the private sector on this are totally in the tank for the government. And that's just to make fun of Republicans for, for a minute. Uh, um, the bill that's going through Congress now, that just was passed by the House, uh, was amended at the last minute to respond to administration and privacy groups' objections that it was somehow enabling something that was like private uh, responses. And uh, they took out language uh, that talked about uh, uh, defensive measures as things that were designed to protect your, uh, uh, your property that ran on your uh, system. And they essentially said, if your defensive measure could, or actually has an effect that renders information on someone else's system inaccessible, then we are giving it no immunity under this law when you share it. Uh, now, there are tools now that will say, I'm encrypting this data on my system, and if it's moved to another part of my system or to somebody else's system, it's going to look around, it's going to say, whoa, I'm not in Kansas anymore. I'm going to stay encrypted until I get back on the, the right system. That means that when the hackers steal your information and they put it on their system and they turn it up, it's rendered inaccessible by your defensive measure. The House of Representatives, in an effort to protect us in this bill, has made it clear that that is going to get no protection under the new law. None. So this is definitely not getting, this is definitely getting to my area of non-expertise and ignorance, but um, this might be an area where we would uh, welcome prosecutorial discretion by the executive branch, uh, unlike other areas. Uh, so if you, uh, it, was, it just came to while you were talking about this neighborhood watch idea. So um, why do you need Congress to change the law to permit the kind of proactive responses or even but the thing that's stopping you is the, the threat of criminal prosecution for logging on other people's networks, right? But uh, right, this reminds me of a you know, common hypothetical. What if your neighbor uh, was trying to repeatedly trying to burn your house down, right? And not trying to hurt you, but destroy your property, and the police aren't doing anything about it? Then in the common law, wouldn't we recognize some kind of reasonable... Uh, defense on the part of you if you wanted to take measures to stop them from burning your house down, which ultimately would be like restraining him from burning your house down. Um, and no prosecutors would not bring a case on this unless they were nuts. Oh, right? I strongly disagree with this. I'm not having no. Yeah. Go ahead. I want to hear what you say. Because first, we've already got situations where um, there have been banks, um, one in particular who um, FBI agents believe they might have stepped too far out and done something that was in violation, the next thing you know, you have FBI agents who, rightly so, their job is to investigate any allegations of concern to breaking laws. And clearly, CFA is a law. So they did their job and started issuing subpoenas to the bank. Now, the bank was engaging in the FSI SAC kind of discussion of sharing information and may have probably shared more than the FBI agent who the information were happy because they saw it from the law. They're not into FBI agents are not thinking, well, it's very critically important, the president says, to share information. We need the banks to share information for the security. FBI agents were just doing their job. And then it's up to a prosecutor, and I will, I would, personally, I would not ever advise a client that, well, you go and do this, and we're just going to hope that an FBI agent and a prosecutor who has independent discretion is just not going to bring a case against you. Oh, no, so well, I, I, want that. I want to work hard, and Stuart works really hard. It is not easy to get Congress to support these efforts. Well, why can't the Justice Department it? issue a guidance as they do? Well, they have. They, 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 they have that guidance up to now. Is it is, no, that's what I mean. Bad idea. So why, not, yeah, so why not have the Justice Department with uh, someone else in leadership? I mean, we have a new attorney general, mm -hmm. and she promised her number one priority was going to be cyber, you know, we're going to have the rules of cyber defense. So. 
they could just issue a different guidance, which would not be we're going to consider any logging onto any network, a, you know, invest, you know, potential crime. But if you're doing it to defend yourself and your own systems from foreign, you know, foreign intrusion, in the situations that Stuart's describing, why can't the? I don't think that's rewriting the law in the way we think the, you know, there's some people think. <laughs> not, some people might think that refusing to enforce a law in full categories of cases is saying this is what we think is a reasonable defense and we're not going to bring these reasonable defense under a prosecution. We're not going to bring those cases. So I agree that right now you can't do it. But why isn't this one thing you can do without having to wait on Congress? And it could be a so, sir, relatively easy fix. Sir, could you see a system where the, uh, the Department of Justice set up a, um, a clearinghouse where the bank would, instead of having to go through a process to get a even a civil subpoena or a civil the, the bank would just register and say, here's what's happened, here's what we're doing. And then they would feel free to do it once they'd registered their action, and then somebody at DOJ oversaw that, looked at them from time to time, and if they had a problem, they went to the bank and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. But, but it was a presumptive go as opposed to a presumptive no. I think for some, I, 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 would, I would say by category, yes. There, there, there would be some categories where you'd say, just tell us that you're doing this so we know if something goes wrong, who to blame, uh, and so that you feel uh, constrained to do it right. Uh, and there are probably other things, you wouldn't want to just let everybody say, I'm going to violate the CFAA uh, uh, wholesale, uh, and I'm telling you. Uh, but uh, but some mechanism like that, right, no, oh, no action letters, the SEC is full of no action letters, the Justice Department hates them. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we have given in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as uh, 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 Aaron Schwartz uh, uh, memorialists will tell us, uh, enormous, enormous prosecutorial discretion. Basically, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says, don't do anything bad with the computer. And if you do, it's a felony. Uh, and uh, that allows us to stretch the act to cover new kinds of things that everybody agrees are crimes. But it means that a whole bunch of things that aren't really crimes are also potentially swept in. Uh, uh, and on the left, that's something that people now sort of believe. I think it's uh, something we should all acknowledge and, and struggle to find a way around. So that registry example, people have thought about that as an option. The problem that they've identified is how fast the victim companies have to change their techniques, right, and what they're doing. And to be honest with you, um, good friends with them, but most of the lawyers at DOJ have no clue about the technology that they're being told, I am doing this. And they take, as lawyers should, they take their time, they analyze it. In the meantime, the companies are sitting there completely. So there's no registry. That has been happening. But the thought of the reason why we, no one has said, oh, let's kind of uh, concretize this and do this in that way is because the companies believe that would not work. Well, but I think you have to set it up so that they didn't have to wait. Right. They registered, they went ahead, and then they registered. Yeah, I'm not so sure the lawyers. I actually think there's, there's a little bit, you know, there's a creak or two that suggests that maybe the river will break up someday. I, uh, where yeah. people, that, well, I, I'm thinking of, 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 you know, of a river in Alaska, but uh, I, there is frozen, frozen over exactly. And then in the spring, you kind of hear Ted creek, Stevens creek, Memorial creek. Bridge goes over. Uh, sorry. I, it, but when I give the example I gave here to people in government, they're embarrassed. Could you get your clients to kind of call us and, and, you know, I'm sure we can find some way to work this out. So uh, they're, they're slowly saying, you know, uh, and I think as we discovered, a lot of these forensic firms, they have plenty of cleared people, work closely with the government, uh, sometimes on contracts with the government. Uh, it may just be a matter of changing hats and suddenly they can do stuff for the government. Uh, and they just have to call up the, the, the bureau or the agency and say, uh, like we discussed, it's time for me to change my hat. I want to do this under your authority. So there are ways to make this happen without uh, an elaborate change in the law, but I think in the end, the law has to change. So this, I, I want to get just one more round in before we go to questions, and this is a good setup for it. Uh, I'd like to ask all the panelists uh, just Looking back over the last uh, six, seven years, uh, are we making gradual progress? We're a little bit safer. Uh, we're making no progress. We're going backwards. How, how, how would you characterize the, 
trajectory on cybersecurity since, for example, January 20th, 2009? We are getting less safe because, not, not because of what we're doing, but because the, our opponents are getting better and there are more of them, and, and they've seen that this works as a way of coercing the United States. Uh, uh, that, that's all bad news. Uh, our defenses are better, but still lagging uh, ever more behind the attacks. Uh, the good news in this area, and it is really very substantial good news, is that uh, in the last five years we've gotten much better at attributing these attacks, so we've put real resources into it, and we can identify our attackers in many cases, with a lot of help from the forensic guys. Uh, uh, and uh, this administration has begun to think a little creatively about how to move from attribution to retribution, to punish people. Uh, and I'm a big fan of, was a longtime proponent of what the Treasury has done in saying we will sanction not just the people who are stealing our secrets, but the big state-owned enterprises that are benefiting from those stolen secrets to break into world markets. Those guys are susceptible to that kind of pressure, and uh, we need to bring a case or two very carefully, but they, that's potentially a game changer. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I defer to Stuart on whether the security situation is worse or better. Just reading the popular press, it seems to be worse because we seem to be suffering more attacks. Our opponents are better. And I think Eric is right. Certainly, cyber warfare is spreading the ability to wage violence into more hands. A lot of them may not even be states. I think the problem on our side is our thinking is not evolving fast enough to keep up with uh, what's happening. So, yeah, I guess. Jared, Jeremy took, I'm not going to talk anymore because Jeremy's right. I think that we should be more, consider more uh, kinds of options uh, ranging, I mean, below and, and higher in terms of destructiveness, in terms of our response. But I, I don't think we are because I think we're tying our own hands intellectually and legally. So on the, um, the cybersecurity front, mainly thinking about the industry, I think um, there's improvement that we can point to, meaning one big change that I've seen in the past year. So we know all know about the big breaches. So that seems just like all bad news, right? We have really big companies that are still not securing themselves um, enough. They argue when you're against a nation state, it'll be impossible for them to ever do that. The good news, though, and the change that I saw this year, predominantly, there seems to be a consensus among the industry people that what dominated their thinking for years, and that was perimeter security, right? That you put your antivirus software in, you protect yourselves at the perimeter of your networks, and you're going to be safe. I am convinced now this year that just about every major company in the cybersecurity industry realizes that is not working, hasn't been working. They've kind of accepted this. It's like they finally convinced themselves, and they are making progress. There is a you know, a handful of uh, smaller sized companies that are excellent at, you know, the threat intelligence, right? That is an industry that's going to build up, I think, even larger. It's right now in its infancy. Um, but I think that's progress, right? They recognize what we've been relying on for decades on perimeter security is not working. They accept it. And now we're making um, headway into what can we do outside our perimeter do threat, which is not based on just the signatures, right, that we know about. We've got to worry about the zero day. So that's on the industry side. On the policy side, you know, so I tend to be an optimist. Um, I can point out, and, and Stuart is great at pointing out um, how bad we are, right, with what we're not good at. I kind of see that we are making progress. Not that many years ago, uh, we, first of all, the, I remember when State Department didn't even talk about cyber. I mean, not that long ago. And I remember saying to the DASB at, at DOD for cyber policy, well, why are you talking about this and doing this? We're State Department, right, on these international issues. So organizationally, I think we're making progress. At least we have strategies. I mean, sometimes the, like, the new strategy doesn't look that different than the last one. Like Secretary Carter, to be honest with you, I think they like changed the font size and, and, <laughs> and, and maybe reorganized a few things. But OK, we have people thinking about it. And the military, and I know not everyone and Stuart, although a good friend, he gives me a hard time about norms. Uh, but I see that as progressive, that we do have states, not always in agreement, 
but at least now they're at the table talking about cyber. And sometimes each time like the UNGG meets in New York, they each say a little more to each other. Now it might not resolve the problem, but it's like every year we know a little more about the Russians, or at least their view on this, or the Chinese. We might not be happy when we walk out the door of that meeting. I think that's progress, and that picks up the next year. So I think on the policy, the international level, cooperative efforts, you have regional organizations, not just the international organizations, a lot of bilateral discussions by states. And that may be the future, where on the international level, we're going to make deals one and two countries at a time. I think that that's, that's a good part. We might not have a perfect looking strategy that's public, but if we have some strong commitments among allies and others about what are some rules between us, that's going to help in the long run. So I'm overall optimistic. And to hear the last word, you must keep up with people in the, in the military. Do they, do they feel they're making progress? I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, the, the history of warfare, uh, whether soft or hard warfare, tells us that offense always outpaces the defense. And that's especially true in the cyber realm now. Um, you cannot defend against the newest thing. It, it, you just are always behind that power curve. And so um, I think that, uh, that, that some of the recent things that the government is doing are helpful. Um, in my mind, we don't turn the corner until we get to the point where states are willing to accept attribution for attacks that come from non-state actors within their borders. That's when we turn the corner. OK, so we have two minutes for questions, sir. Um, as someone in the private sector um, and have now just spent a week at RSA, there was 165 startups on the floor in cyber defense, 45 from Israel. And my bias is that while the lumbering government tries to solve this, they're moving so fast, it's actually very inspirational to see how fast they're just saving themselves. Because having been hacked and tried to use the CFAA and criminally and got nowhere. So try to use it civilly and have the federal judge throw it out because he said there was no law established for this. So we had to go to telephonic law and the perpetrator was in another state. That didn't work. So um, how do you, are, are we gonna get out of our own way? We've got, I think the FTC, FCC, SEC kind of anti-private enterprise. And then when I've, I've spoken on this and I've had people from the FBI and NSA come up to me after and say, that kind of anti-private enterprise behavior is very, uh, it really gets the way what we're trying to achieve by working together. This is, it, it is such a amazingly, it requires such nimble speed. Are we, are we even capable of, of solving this? At the time? I see private enterprise blowing away with the federal government. Anyone want to take it? Yeah, clearly, <laughs> private enterprise is ahead of the government. They're, they're paid better to solve these problems than the government is. And, and quite frankly, the privacy lobby has opposed everything the government has proposed to do to protect itself until it is an obsolete private sector mechanism, uh, including we're now, we're now finally looking at signatures uh, that are coming in uh, now, that, now that signatures are almost irrelevant to keeping people out of our business. Uh, um, the Israelis, and it's not like the government, there, there's a lack of government involvement in the Israeli sector, but, uh, but they have been very laissez-faire about what they allow their sector to do. And the, in fact, if, if you are in the private sector and you want to do something pretty dramatic to somebody who's attacking you, the received wisdom is you should call up some Israeli firm and say, will no one rid me of this, this, this priest? Uh, uh, and they'll just, you know, solve the problem. Uh, so, Hi, <laughs> so my name is Dr. Ishaan. I'm the co-chair of the American Bar Association National Task Force on Cyber and Law. At the Steptoe Cafeteria, so <laughs> what's that word?
I don't want to go for it. <laughs> uh, we'll get together after. Uh, I want to thank everyone, though, for putting this together. And I guess the question I have is there's another issue that happened in the last few weeks. Had first the executive order on sanctions for cyber. A standard was set that would allow the president an emergency powers to use our favorite. Is about the encryption part. So, on the this is a big issue and has been for a while, and it's basically we are either resurrecting the, the conflict between law enforcement and um, the private sector, at least the computer security sector that happened in the 90s. If you recall, when Louis Free was FBI director. You know, my position. Not a lot of my government friends agree with me, but my position is um, the government. My attitude towards their argument that they should have access to this, and they'll try to demand access. And you know, the Apple, you know, Cook saying, "Well, we're not going to have the keys, so even if you come to us, we're not going to be able to give you access." I think it's um, that's fine. I mean, and I think the government um, needs to drop this fight. I mean, they lost the clipper tip. It's as if they forgot, you know, that new people are in the government, and they're we're re resurrecting the exact same argument that they lost. Unless we want our economy to just go into the toilet and every American company, particularly in the technology field, to fail, I think the government has to give up this fight. And, and my, my view is I think the government can and should get better at breaking the encryption. And I think let's just get more innovative. NSA has brilliant people. And if we, if we push them, I think they can even do more than they're doing now in terms of that capability. So if you have something that's encrypted because our companies have encrypted it and the FBI can't get, be given access to it even, then I think NSA um, gets better at being able to break that encryption. Well, I've got a contribution to this today. You remember this? Yeah. This was the number one song the year we first had this debate. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is the same debate, and, and the, the, but I disagree with Catherine uh, uh, that, uh, well, first, the, the breaking the encryption is not going to happen. It's too easy to build good encryption and too hard to break. Uh, uh, a, and uh, um, even NSA has spent most of its time finding ways to, to get access other than through the encryption. Uh, uh, a, the problem is it's only Silicon Valley who believes that end-to-end -end perfect encryption for everybody is what the world wants. Uh, um, everywhere but the United States, this is a complete non-starter. Every government believes that this is crazy. Even the UK has taken to trashing US companies as being terror-friendly. Uh, because of the kinds of uh, security that they're providing. 
Uh, and uh, you know, when you get to Russia and China, we, we do a study of uh, encryption controls. They still have encryption controls, and they're going to strengthen them. Uh, uh, and so the, the Silicon Valley effort to provide encryption to everybody to make them love them is going to fail, I believe. Uh, uh, and what we're going to get probably is some kind of crappy uh, escrow system as opposed to a real key escrow system. If you look at what governments have done in response to end-to-end -end, uh, SSL encryption or TLS encryption, they've gone around stealing people's certificates and uh, doing wholesale decryption of communications and managing it all. Uh, we're not going to get into a world where governments are totally disabled, except perhaps for the U.S. government, uh, which isn't going to do a lot of those things and has a big tech lobby that will be opposing that. But I don't think this is going to end quite as neatly with the triumph of the nerds as the guys in Silicon Valley believe. So I just have two. Oh, um, the, I'm not a computer scientist. The ones I talk to tell me that the problem with encryption is that there's still the human element. You, you get around it with the key. They don't, they don't, many, most ones I talk to still see that as the solution. And let me just read to you what Harvey was talking about, this economic issue. This is, I think, pretty uh, profound in terms of DOD taking a stance. They, I, I already brought your attention to the fact that they don't talk about armed conflict or they talk about significant consequences. Here's how the DOD cyber strategy defines significant consequences. Significant consequences may include loss of life. Well, that seems like a DOD thing. Significant damage to property, serious adverse U.S. foreign policy consequences, or serious economic impact on the United States. So that's now what DOD sees the commission. So we, we, we can do one more question. Um, yeah, quick question. I talked to the DOJ about a hack that I had because it was the time before after the fight where I ran. And they were trying to get access to my server for Iran, and they could do it in Kansas. First of all, I'm not sure that legislation is constitutionally uh, survivable. Uh, secondly, uh, I think they should be able to. And why can't we get no <laughs> We just have to ask China for it. They've got all their emails. <laughs> what, sir? <laughs> okay, so uh, regarding the lunch, uh, that was very interesting. And, uh, I, um, the lunch is set up, the buffet tables uh, just outside those doors there, and I guess you can take what you like and come back here. And Harvey, it's on me. <laughs> <laughs>